Johanna Adcock and I am going to read the epilogue from Lanark by Alistair Gray. The epilogue comes before the ending of the book because the author had some things to say that were just too important to leave till the end. A king with a bad constitution. He entered a room with no architectural similarity to the building he had left. The door on this side had deeply moulded panels and a knob, the ceiling was bordered by an elaborate cornice of acanthus sprays, there was a tall bay window with the upper foliage of a chestnut tree outside and an old stone tenement beyond. The rest of the room was hidden by easels holding large paintings of the room. The pictures seemed brighter and cleaner than the reality and a tall beautiful girl with long blonde hair reclined in them sometimes nude and sometimes clothed. The girl herself, more worried and untidy than her portraits, stood near the door wearing a paint-stained butcher's apron. With a very small brush she was adding leaves to a view of the tree outside the window, but she paused, pointed round the edge of the picture and told Lanark, he's there. A voice said, yes, come round, come round. Lanark went behind the picture and found a stout man leaning against a pile of pillows on a low bed. His face, framed by wings and horns of uncombed hair, looked statuesque and noble, apart from an apprehensive, rather cowardly expression. He wore a woollen jersey over a pyjama jacket, neither of them clean. The coverlet over his knees was littered with books and papers, and there was a pen in his hand. Glancing at Lanark in a sly, sideways fashion, he indicated a chair with a pen and said, Please sit down. Are you the king of this place? The king of Proven, yes, and Unthank too, and that suite of rooms you call the Institute and the Council. Then perhaps you could help me. I am here. Yes, I know roughly what you want and I would like to help. I would even offer you a drink, but there's too much intoxication in this book. Book? This world, I meant to say. You see, I'm the king, not the government. I have laid out landscapes and stocked them with people, and I still work an occasional miracle. But governing is left to folk like Mombado and Sludden. Why? The king closed his eyes, smiled and said, I brought you here to ask that question. Will you answer it? Not yet. Lanark felt very angry. He stood up and said, Then talking to you is a waste of time. Waste of time, said the king, opening his eyes. You clearly don't realise who I am. I have called myself a king. That's a purely symbolic name. I am far more important. Read this and you'll understand. The critics will accuse me of self-indulgence, but I don't care. Footnote. To have an objection anticipated is no reason for failing to raise it. With a reckless gesture, he handed Lanark a paper from the bed. It was covered with childish handwriting and many words were scored out or inserted with little arrows. Much of it seemed to be dialogue, but Lanark's eye was caught by a sentence in italics which said, Much of it seemed to be dialogue, but Lanark's eye was caught by a sentence in italics which said, Lanark gave the paper back, asking, What's that supposed to prove? I am your author. Lanark stared at him. The author, the author said, Please don't feel embarrassed. This isn't an unprecedented situation. Bonnegut has it in Breakfast of Champions and Jehovah in the books of Job and Jonah. Are you pretending to be God? Not nowadays. I used to be part of him, though. Yes, I am a part of a part which was once the whole. 
but I went bad and was excreted. If I can get well, I may be allowed home before I die. So I continually plunge my beak into my rotten liver and swallow and excrete it, but it grows again. Creation festers in me. I am excreting you and your world at the present moment. This arsewipe, he stirred the papers on the bed, is part of the process. I am not religious, said Lanark, but I don't like you mixing religion with excrement. Last night I saw a part of the person you are referring to, and it was not at all nasty. You saw part of God, cried the author. How did that happen? Lanark explained. The author was greatly excited. He said, say those words again. Is, 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 then a pause, then is. If, is. If, shouted the author, sitting upright. He actually said, if. He wasn't simply snarling, is, 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 all the time. Lanark said, I don't like you saying he like that. What I saw may not have been masculine. It may not have been human, but it certainly wasn't snarling. What's wrong with you? The author had covered his mouth with his hands, apparently to stifle laughter, but his eyes were wet. He gulped and said, One if to five is's. That's an incredible amount of freedom. But can I believe you? I've created you honest, but can I trust your senses? At a great altitude, is and if must sound very much alike. You seem to take words very seriously, said Lanark, with a touch of contempt. Yes, you don't like me, but that can't, help be, can't be helped. I'm primarily a literary man, said the author with a faintly na nasal accent and started, started chuckling to himself. The tall blonde girl came round the edge of the painting, wiping her brush on her apron. She said defiantly, I've finished the tree. Can I leave now? The author leaned back on his pillow and said sweetly, Of course, Marion. Leave when you like. I need money. I'm hungry. Why don't you go to the kitchen? I believe there's some cold chicken in the fridge. I'm sure Pat won't mind making yourself a snack. I don't want a snack. I want a meal with a friend in a restaurant. And I want to go to a film afterward, or to a pub, or to a hairdresser if I feel like it. I'm sorry, but I want money. Of course you do, and you've earned it. How much do I owe? Five hours today at 50 pence an hour is two pounds fifty, with yesterday and the day before, and the day before is ten pounds, isn't it? I've a poor head for arithmetic, but you're probably right, said the author, taking coins from under a pillow and giving them to her. This is all I have just now, nearly two pounds. Come back tomorrow and, and I'll see if I can manage a little extra. The girl scowled at the coins in her hand and then at the author. He was puffing medicinal spray into his mouth from a tiny hand pump. She went abruptly behind the painting again, and they heard the door slam. Strange girl, murmured the author, sighing. I do my best to help her, but it isn't easy. Lanark had been sitting with his head propped on his hands. He said, you say you are creating me. I am. Then how can I have experiences you don't know about? You're surprised when I told you what I saw from the aircraft. The answer to that is unusually interesting. Please attend closely. When Lanark is finished, I am calling the work after you, it will be roughly 200,000 words and 40 chapters long and divided into books 3, 1, 2 and 4. Why not 1, 2, 3 and 4? 
I want Lanark to be read in one order, but eventually thought of in another. It's an old device. Homer, Virgil, Milton, and Scott Fitzgerald used it. Footnote. Each of the four authors mentioned have a large work in medias res, but none of them numbered their divisions out of logical sequence. There will also be a prologue before book one, an interlude in the centre, and an epilogue two or three chapters before the end. I thought epilogues came after the end. Usually, but mine is too important to go there. Though not essential to the plot, it provides some comic distraction at a moment when the narrative sorely needs it, and it lets me utter some fine sentiments which I could hardly trust from mere character. And it contains critical notes which will save research scholars years of toil. In fact, my epilogue is so essential that I am working on it with nearly a quarter of the book still unwritten. I am working on it here just now in this conversation. But you have had to reach this room by passing through several chapters I haven't clearly imagined yet, so you know details of the story which I don't. Of course, I know the broad general outline. There were, that was planned years ago and mustn't be changed. You have come here from my city of destruction, which is rather like Glasgow, to plead before some sort of world parliament in an ideal city based on Edinburgh or London or perhaps Paris if I can wrangle a grant from the Scottish Arts Council. To go there. Footnote. In 1973, as a result of sponsorship sponsorship by the poet Edwin Morgan, the author received a grant of £300 from the Scottish Arts Council for the purpose of helping him write his book, but it was never assumed that he would use the money to seek out exotic local colour. Tell me, when you were landing this morning, did you see the Eiffel Tower, or Big Ben, or a rock with a castle on it? No, Proven is very like Stop. Don't tell me. My fictions often anticipate the experiences they're based upon, but no author should rely on that sort of thing. Lanark was so agitated that he stood and walked to the window to sort out his thoughts. The author struck him as a slippery person, but too vain and garrulous to be impressive. He went back to the bed and said, How will my story end? Catastrophically.